All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, May 6th. 2016. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and we've got a very, very special episode of the Weekly Space Hangout today. We're going to be talking about, he says, looking at his screen, we're going to be talking about Comet Panstars, th This Week in Musk, uh, new X-ray, ultra-luminous X-ray sources, ExoMars Phase 2, uh, a really, really, really big radio telescope, the second strongest shockwave found in merging galaxy clusters, and three new potentially habitable worlds. So we got a bunch of stories to talk about, and we've got a brand new broadcasting system that we're using. So before we were using uh, Google Hangouts on Air, now we're using Wirecast, which is going to give us a little more flexibility. The hope is that we're going to be able to show you a bunch of really cool pictures and stuff as we do this show. Who knows? Uh, we'll see if we can figure this out. Uh, sitting right beside me is is Chad, who is the uh, cameraman and editor for The Guide to Space, and now we're going to take his mad editing skills and bring these alive. So, joining me this week, let's start with Morgan. We got Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Oh, no. oh Chad. No. All right. We got Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. How's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you guys doing? We're doing really well. Um, let's go to Kimberly. We got Kimberly. Yes. <laughs> hey, Kimberly. How's it going? All right, we're going to go to Paul next. There's two, are there two Paul, Paul Metzutter. Okay. Yeah, we got Paul Metzutter. <laughs> the director of Awesome. That was the title that he chose. Um, and we got Dave Dickinson. Dave Dickinson. Hey, hey, still in Spain. You're still in Spain? The homeless astronomer. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a big delay on this. There is it, only for you. Only because you're in Spain. Okay. Uh, and we've got a special guest this week from NASA. We've got Paul Reichert. Paul, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for being our, our guinea pig this week. We really appreciate you. Uh, unwilling, perhaps? Unknowing guinea pig? Uh, so I just want to remind everyone that this is a live show. We are... Uh, recording this live. We're happy to take your comments and questions both for the panel as well as for our special guests this week. And you're going to have some really cool, uh, I'm sure you're going to have a bunch of good questions. So I'll keep an eye on the chat. And if you've got some questions, I will uh, try and pass them along. All right. So let's start with, with Paul. Uh, so Paul, why don't you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, oh. oh, really? So is it the volume, or is it that you're not pushing everyone's audio out the... This thing's going out, or it should be. Yeah? Let me see. All right, Paul, so we're going to try and crank the output audio, so let us know if uh, if this fixes it. So they can hear, they just can't hear. They can't hear it, it's just not very loud? Okay. He's saying they only have my audio. Oh, lovely. Yeah? No, that's just me. Yeah? They can hear the others, but they're just quiet. They're very quiet, okay. So I wonder if you can do that in the source. All right, Paul. So why don't we we'll start asking you some questions and uh, and we'll see if we can crank the audio as we go. So okay, Paul, so why don't you let us know sort of who you are and uh, and what you do? Okay, so I'm Paul Riker and I work at the Good him? Johnson Space Center, Houston, Texas. Yeah, you know, there's there's not a lot of differences. Um, certainly, the crew is is obviously weightless um, when they're on orbit, so it's hard to ground yourself and stay stable in one spot. So that's a little bit of a challenge. But probably the biggest challenges that we have is when we take cameras on spacewalks, because the crew is in these big bulky suits and they're pressurized, 
and they don't have much tactile feel. So um, when they take pictures, when they're out on a spacewalk, um, it's a lot different. It's a lot tougher. Uh, you can't feel the buttons. You just kind of have to feel in a certain area. And, and uh, we have some indications on the camera that will tell them if they took a picture or not. Um, but for the most part, uh, a lot of it is the same. Of course, the bigger equipment that's really heavy on Earth is pretty easy to get around on orbit because it doesn't weigh anything. So uh, sometimes we use great big lenses to take pictures that, you know, on the ground, the whole system might weigh close to 20 pounds, but up there they just pick it up and float around with it. Um, as far as the spacewalk goes, they really don't have much control over the camera because we have to put a what we call a thermal blanket over the camera because the difference between daylight and shadow um, on in space is about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So really, when we set up a camera to do a spacewalk, we put this thermal blanket on there and the camera is completely set up to automatic. And so all they have to do is press the shutter release. And the cameras nowadays, they do a very good job at adjusting at whatever light level is coming into the camera. So um, we kind of rely on the camera's automation to really help us out on spacewalks. Right, right, right. So they, uh, Morgan, you got a question. Jared, I want to kind of know more about the cameras themselves. You're talking here about sort of the, you know, how well they're able to adapt to the light conditions, but do these at all resemble the sorts of cameras that, uh, that we would go out and buy? Do they have SD cards that slide into them? That sort mm -hmm. of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends on what camera you're talking about. Um, the still cameras and the video cameras that we use are pretty much right off the shelf. Um, maybe a little firmware modification that we've made or the, cam or the camera manufacturer has made for us. But really, for the most part, they're straight off the shelf. There are other cameras that we have, like we have a thermal infrared camera that was uh, developed about 10 years ago. And it was actually an off the shelf camera, but since we were gonna take it on a spacewalk and be in pretty harsh conditions, they had to, we had to have a, a NASA engineering group build a new body for it. So they essentially built a very durable, tough body and then put all the electronics back into that body. And so that's what we still use today. So it really depends on what, what camera system you're talking about. Awesome. I, I think we got my audio working again, as well as everyone's audio. So uh, thanks again to everyone for dealing with the uh, technical challenges. Uh, who were some of, I, I, you know, with some of the recent astronauts, a lot of them really kind of pushed the boundaries of the kinds of photography they were taking. I know, I know Commander Chris Hadfield, um, uh, Ron Garin, they were doing a lot of really interesting artistic work with the camera as well. So, you know, does, does the art side of it come into some of the training? Absolutely. You know, a lot of, a lot of photos that we take are, are very technical and most people that we work with here are very technical. They're engineers. Most of the astronauts are engineers or technical scientists. So, you know, one thing that they don't always deal with is, hey, how do you make a picture actually look good? So we um, talk to them about certain design characteristics and the, how you want to frame up your picture and all that kind of stuff to make it look prettier. Yeah, uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, this one comes from Adam Synergy in the chat. How much training with the cameras do the astronauts get prior to launching? Yeah, so it depends on where the astronauts come from. Uh, the US, US astronauts get about 25-ish hours of camera training with us in classes. And they also get to actually take the cameras home with them um, on weekends and stuff like that so they can practice with it. Because as we all know, if you just take a class and you don't use it for a long, use the information for a long time, you're gonna lose it. So we allow that. The Japanese astronauts and the other international astronauts, they get, you know, maybe about 15 to 20 hours with us in the Russian astronauts or cosmonauts as we call them they get uh, maybe about six to 10 hours. So it really depends on what agency they come from. Do they go home with a pair of the gloves as well? And so try to take pictures with the, with the gloves. I've had a chance to try the astronaut gloves and they're, they're rough to try and actually get anything done with. 
yeah, I don't, I don't think they get to let them take the gloves home, but uh, um, yeah, you know, if you ever put one of those gloves on, you know, it's pretty thick. It's like wearing like three or four, you know, leather, you know, gardening gloves on your hand. But then imagine if you will, they put four or five pounds of pressure inside of it. And all of a sudden your hand is kind of like a balloon and it's, it takes a lot of force to move the, the fingertips around. So that's, again, that's what makes the, the spacewalk photography a little bit challenging. I know in the olden days with the first uh, Apollo astronauts, they, they were using these really fancy Hasselblad cameras. What are some of the other kinds of cameras that, that, that they're working with these days? Um, well, we work with, you know, the top of the line still camera um, out on the markets or out on the market. Um, some of the, you know, any, we, our ranges of lenses go anywhere from eight millimeters to 1600 millimeters. Um, we have some action cameras on board. We have, um, you know, video cameras, different video cameras that we use. We have some specialty cameras like that thermal infrared camera I was telling you about. Um, so there's a pretty wide range of, of cameras. And so what are some of the more, look at this. Anyway, uh, what are some of the the more extreme environments, some of the situations where it's like pushing that camera to the limit is is the job? Like I know that, you know, some extreme sunlight or perhaps, you know, you're doing something fairly technical and you really need to get some magnification. What uh, what does that take? <clears throat> so part of the challenge of the, the photography up there is, you know, the sun. The sun is a lot brighter up there than it is on earth. So, you know, a lot of times we'll have to take pictures of structure of the station. One of the things people don't realize is that the space station actually gets hit by little debris quite often and it'll create, you know, maybe a, a tear in the solar array or, you know, a little ding on a handrail or something like that. And we're tasked to have the crew take those pictures. And a lot of times we have to work with different groups um, at the center um, there's one group in particular that they, you can give them a time of day and a date and they can figure out exactly at what time at that day, the sun angle is going to be on a certain surface and all that kind of stuff. So we can try to time the photography around bad sun angles and bad reflections and that kind of stuff. What about lighting? Because I know like when, when, when you're in the space station and you go into the Earth's shadow, it's complete and total darkness. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I guess, as you said, you have to switch from really bright, unfiltered sunlight right to total darkness and then back again in, what, 45 minutes. So how does that environment change things? Um, you know, I don't think it changes it all that much. You know, it's, it's, it's a very quick transition from day to night and night to day. But other than that, the cameras really don't have too many issues with that. Um, you know, you've probably seen a lot of the imagery where the – the crew has done time-lapse uh, pictures around the earth. And, and uh, if you've ever seen any of these on YouTube, they'll go from, you know, they'll be flying over the earth at night and you'll see city lights go by and there'll be lightning and auroras. But if you ever watch one where it quickly or at the end or at the beginning where it goes in from night to day, you see that transition is very, very quick. The sun comes up in about 20 seconds and it's completely daytime at that point. And the, the cameras, tend not to handle that so well at the transition point, but once the sun is fully up, um, they do a pretty good job. Yeah, uh, that is that is really cool. So I got a couple more questions here. One, this comes from Ilad Avron. Uh, when astronauts publish photos on social media, is it them directly or does it go through mission control? Like, can they actually be Snapchatting from space? I don't know if they do Snapchatting, but I know some of them will tweet and put pictures on Facebook themselves. Some people or some of the crew members have people on the ground that help them out because their their timeline on on board is is just so busy. Um, the crew is basically timeline for about 12 hours a day uh, for between work and exercise and eating. And basically, the way NASA schedules them is every five minutes there's something that they're doing. So uh, some some crew members find more time to post the pictures themselves and others uh, rely on some folks on the ground. Uh, this question comes from uh, Sylvan Westby. Uh, how have long telephoto lenses replaced the Celestron C8, C6, C8 telescopes they used to use for Earth imaging back in the day? So 
Um, what are they doing for some of those really long telephoto shots? Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the, the, the telescope stuff, um, but for uh, Earth observation with the high magnification lenses, they're using anywhere from, you know, 400 millimeters to they can go all the way up to 1600 millimeter uh, focal length. And what's it really interesting is that on the station, it really depends on, on what windows you use because certain windows have higher image quality or higher optical quality than other windows. So when they take uh, pictures, uh, super high magnification pictures of the earth, they're using certain windows and they're probably using, um, you know, around uh, 1100 to 1600 millimeters. Matter of fact, a couple months ago, the crew was taking pictures of a, um, I think it was Montreal, and they were using probably the sharpest window that the, that the station has. And they took a picture of Montreal and I could see the Olympic Stadium. And not only could I see the stadium, but when I looked at the stadium, I could see the track and I could almost make out the lines on the, on the track. Was- and, and that's handheld shot. That's not like some, you know, some telescope in space that's designed to be that, that precise. That's correct. That's a, that's a handheld camera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about those great time lapses that, that we see coming from the station as well? Are those, uh, are they, are they setting those up? Yep, the crew sets those up and, uh, you know, they set it up in a, one of the windows on the station and they, they actually have a program that will tell them exactly where they'll be and at what time. So, you know, if they're going to fly over a certain location, like maybe Europe or the United States or, you know, Asia, something like that, something that they want to capture, they'll set up the camera beforehand. And then with this program on the computer, they'll know exactly when they're going to fly over there. So they'll start it a little bit early and then end the, the interval a little bit after, or after they go past it. And so it's kind of all automated, but yeah, it works out pretty well. Um, so I got another question here. This comes from Guido Bibra. Um, I remember an astronaut, possibly Samantha Cristoforetti, talking about getting daily lists for photo opportunities depending on the orbit of ISS. Can you tell us anything about that? So do you let them know what they could take some shots of in advance? Yep, there's uh, actually a group at, at the Johnson Space Center called the Earth Observation Group. And what they do is they have certain targets on the Earth that are of interest to them, maybe for a study of some kind, or maybe there's a real-time event going on there. And what they'll do is they'll actually put those events or when they're going to fly over those locations on the crew's timeline. And the crew can, if they have time available, can go and photograph those places. Most of the crew, most crew members really like doing that because it not only does it help out the ground, but it's uh, it's it's usually a way to get some pretty spectacular photography. Uh, and I, I would like to know: Have you got like some favorite shots? Some ones that you're just you know you really like the pictures? Yeah, I think you know I've got a lot of favorite shots. I don't think there's one, but um, you know there's always the the iconic shots like um, um, on 9/11, the crew flew over New York City, and you could see the the towers. Um, that's pretty dramatic. I always thought the there's a picture or there's pictures of Washington DC at night where you can actually see in lights the outline of the District of Columbia. I always thought that was pretty cool. But some of the pictures that I'm I'm most proud of uh, the crew is some of the very technical photos that they they have to take. Like I said earlier, the the station does get a um, say pelted, but it does get hit a little bit by micrometeoroid debris that's on orbit and there's it creates some damage on the space station so every once in a while the crew has to take pictures from from different windows of this of this debris and they have to you know be very precise in how they do it they're usually using very large lenses with a lot of magnification and they have to hold the camera very still and they have to understand how the camera works to get the the best photos possible and you know when those pictures are really good they're used as engineering data uh, by the engineers on the ground so they can figure out how big things are, how deep divots are, um, all that kind of stuff and get, you know, pretty precise measurements. And that's really not possible without, you know, good skill uh, that the crew members have. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we're sort of 
And running out of our time to talk with you, Paul, uh, where can people find out more? Where can they go to actually sort of see a lot of these images on, you know, if they want to see, especially some of the ones that, you know, they, the, some of the more technical ones, like the raw feeds, where do they go? Um, you know, I know the nasa.gov website has a lot of these images and um, you can find a lot of them. Um, depending on what the subject of the, the picture is, they, NASA may not release it. Um, but the nasa.gov website does have a lot of these pictures and information on there. Yeah, I know that a lot of the, the images just comes down in, in the raw. And as you said, now that a lot of them are on social media, and so you might see it get on Instagram before it even shows up on, on nasa.gov. So, uh, well, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's absolutely fascinating. I know that, that we, especially us as the journalists, really depend on the pictures that that you guys are releasing and we really appreciate it. And, and it's one of the sort of wonderful things about, about being in the sort of the space exploration side of things is that the pictures are so cool. And it's great to see that so much work gets put into preparing the astronauts beforehand. So, so thank you once again for joining us today. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, all right, so let's move on now uh, to the next big story of, uh, of the week. So I'm going to start with This Week in Musk. Uh, Morgan, why don't we start with, uh, with that? Absolutely. We had two great uh, announcements or events uh, this week uh, from SpaceX. And the first one came earlier this week when they updated uh, the specifications on both the Falcon 9 and the as-yet-unflown Falcon Heavy, uh, saying that both of them could lift more um, mass into orbit or to Mars than previously expected. And they hadn't redesigned the Falcon 9 or anything like that. They simply realized that the engines were operating at a higher efficiency uh, than they previously thought before. Uh, and this is really good because they also announced that any mission that would be using a reusable rocket would be able to carry 40% less mass uh, to orbit than one that was using a rocket that was designed to be expended. And so the fact that they can sort of squeeze additional efficiency out of the already existing Falcon 9 uh, means that when they start using these reusable rockets uh, more regularly, they'll still be able to launch substantial payloads uh, into orbit. Um, much more dramatically on uh, just last night, we saw, or early this morning, depending on where in the world you are, we saw them attempt once more to land uh, a rocket on a barge. Uh, and this came after they launched a Japanese communication satellite. Uh, and the nature of this launch was very different than the nature of their launches they do to the International Space Station. And that dramatically changed uh, what they needed to do in order to accomplish a landing. Uh, because the space station is in a roughly circular orbit and it's relatively close uh, to the surface of the Earth, which means you don't need a tremendous amount of velocity to boost up uh, your payload to the International Space Station. Uh, communication satellites, on the other hand, to place the payload or the satellite in the correct orbit. And of course, the higher up you go, the harder down you're gonna fall. And so this first stage of the Falcon 9 re-entered Earth's atmosphere traveling twice as fast as the one last month that delivered cargo to the International Space Station. Uh, and because of the particular orbit that they were entering, they also had to send the rocket almost horizontal relative to the surface uh, to put uh, the the satellite in the correct location. And that meant that the rocket wasn't really just going straight up, uh, releasing the, the capsule and falling back down to land on the launch pad. They really had to traverse a very long horizontal distance at a much higher speed in order to reach back uh, to the drone ship. Uh, and they, as they always do, showed this live on um, the internet last night. And we saw the rocket coming down, coming down in this bright flash uh, and for a moment, it seemed as if perhaps it hadn't succeeded, but then the camera kind of refocused and we saw almost mm -hmm. This makes a uh, much more uh, challenging landing than they attempted last month, just as successful. Uh, 
apparently we were muting sound as you were as we were showing these pictures. So once again, we've we've learned a, a valuable life lesson. Back to me for a second. Um, so so Morgan, with the you know, because it's this geosynchronous transfer orbit, it's a much more high energy, it's a sort of a different direction. Are they going to have to do this for every, are they going to have to keep using the drone ship every time they want to do these kinds of launches? Or are they going to be able to eventually bring them back to land at the, at the launch site again? Uh, the intention is to continue to use the drone ships. Uh, they think that probably ultimately about 50% of uh, the rockets will land on a drone ship and 50% of them will be able to land uh, on Earth, whether that's returning to Kennedy Space Center in Florida or returning to the California coast if they were to be launching out there or returning to a launch pad, uh, say, in Texas. Uh, but many profiles of p potential launches uh, do carry you a long way away from the land. And that's why they've put such a focus on uh, perfecting the ability to land at sea, even after they receive permission from the Air Force to continue uh, to begin landing uh, on land at uh, Kennedy Space Center. And so, I mean, what's next on our big list of, of to-do items? So probably the biggest thing remaining uh, with respect to the reusable rocket program is to actually fly one of these rockets a second time and show that, yes, not only can they land, but they can be inexpensively uh, and relatively rapidly refurbished and put back into service once more. Looking a little bit more broadly in the SpaceX uh, launch program, by the end of this year, we're hoping to see the first launch of the Falcon Heavy. Uh, and this will enable not only SpaceX to expand into new markets in terms of launching payloads uh, for commercial customers, but also the Falcon Heavy is the rocket that they will need for their ambitions to launch uh, the Dragon capsule and other future spacecraft to Mars. Yeah, with the Falcon Heavy, they're bolting three Falcon 9s together and and I guess I wonder is the whole thing gonna gonna land with all three together, or are they gonna break apart and each one's gonna find its own landing spot? I don't think that they've addressed uh, if or how they intend to land uh, any part of the Falcon Heavy yet. One imagines that they'll first focus on simply getting it off the ground, uh, just like they did with the Falcon Nine, and then once they have shown that it operates reliably uh, in a sort of more traditional launch profile, they can then think about starting to try to bring it. Approach taken by the Falcon 9 is they launched the Falcon 9 many times before they uh, began trying to land it on uh, a barge. Fantastic. All right, well, let's move on to the next story that strikes my fancy. Um, oh, you know what, Dave? You talked about uh, comic... Comet X1 Pan Stars, which I think is super important, but you didn't mention to remind people about the Mercury transit. So maybe we can can we transit can we start Mercury. with that and then and then move on to the Pan Stars story? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna mention that too if I had a chance that uh Monday we have the we talked about it a few weeks ago, but Monday is the transit of Mercury across the face of the sun. Uh North America is going to see it at sunrise. Yep, they're gonna see it at sunrise. And over here, we're gonna in Europe, we're gonna see the entire thing. It's gonna last about seven hours long, starts at eleven twelve uh universal time and goes on till eighteen forty-two universal time. And over towards Southeast Asia, they're gonna see it uh towards sunset. So it's kind of interesting. The last one was in two thousand six. The next one is in two thousand in twenty nineteen. Uh, we had a transit of Venus. We had two. That was one in 2004 and one in 2012. Those are a little more rare. We only had two this century, and we're not getting another transit of Venus till 2117. Transits of Mercury are a little more common. You get about 12 to 13 per century, so that's roughly one to two per decade. It's kind of nifty. You just see Venus, Mercury as a little black dot. This one, Mercury is small enough you're going to need uh, to use some kind of uh, – safely filtered optical uh, telescope or uh, projection. I'm probably gonna be projecting it with binoculars just to take a look at it real quick. But you need one where you have the filter that actually fits on the front of the telescope with the batter solar filter that's meant for, I've made uh, probably half a dozen batter filter uh, masks for telescopes over the years. They're pretty easy to make if you have the sheet, you just make the cardboard filter so it fits. You want it snugly over the front of the scope so the wind won't knock it off. Don't try to look at a, uh, don't try to use solar glasses uh, to look through optics. I've seen people talking about this online. That's a tremendously bad idea because you can, uh, a telescope will melt those easily. 
don't use the old telescopes that had the screw on filters. Uh, they used to actually sell and you still see these at flea markets or at yard sales sometimes don't have the, uh, the little uh, screw on eyepiece filters. Uh, I, you, you probably couldn't even sell those now because they're tremendously dangerous, but um, right. don't use those. Okay. So Monday, make sure you set, set aside some time to watch the. And, and the, uh, the uh, virtual telescope folks are going to be doing a live feed of it as well. And SLU is going to be doing a live feed uh, in the very likely event you're clouded out, which I think we're going to be here in Europe, actually. So, yep. Awesome. All right. Well, let's talk about. Uh... Yes, uh, this is Comet C2013X1 Panstars. It was discovered in late 2013. And this is going to be a good binocular comet. I have not seen this one yet. Uh, it's in the morning sky right now just crossed near the circulated Pisces asterism in into Aquarius. It's crossing south of the ecliptic this weekend. It's unfortunately going to be more of a southern object than a northern object, although here uh, in Spain I'm at about 31 degrees north, about the same longitude or latitude as North Carolina. So if you're North Carolina southward, you might be able to get it about 20 degrees above the horizon right after, uh, right before sunrise in the morning. And it's going to be moving. Uh, one red letter date that's going to be interesting when I ran a simulation is June 4th. The comet is passing very near the Hel Helix Nebula, about 15 arc minutes from it. This photo incidentally was from a Japanese amateur uh, in January. There was an outburst from this comet. It got a little brighter than expected. It was supposed to be around ninth magnitude and it brightened up to about seventh. This is before perihelion. It went behind the sun for perihelion in April, and now it's coming back out in the morning skies, and it's riding about a magnitude brighter than expectations. It's about magnitude plus seven, and it's scheduled to top out at about plus five, which would make it a good binocular slash uh, faint naked eye comet from a dark sky site. But, you know, comets after perihelion typically like to brighten up a little bit, so we, it may get up toward magnitude four. This one, like I said, we had been, I look back to my Twitter stream, we had actually been talking about this one since 2013 when it was first discovered. It was found a little ways out, which made it kind of interesting. It was found right inside the orbit of Saturn, which is unusual to see. Uh, I remember Comet Hale-Bopp, what got everybody excited about that in 95 when they discovered it, was that it was found so far out. That suggested it was a pretty large and intrinsically bright. And remember, Ison, that was found about a year prior too, and that got everybody really excited because you're seeing it that far out and it's discovered that far out that that's a pretty good sign that it might be a, a larger than usual comet and this one uh, unfortunately when i ran simulations are like well it's it's another binocular comet but it's uh, it's not the comet of the century this, this we'll isn't this out. isn't the comet no but you know every every generation it seems we get one about every 20 years uh, you know, there was Ikea Siki in, uh, in the 1960s, and there was Hellbop. We had Hellbop and Hayakutaki right within six months of each other, which was unusual that we had two bright comets. And that happened with Halley's in the Great Comet in 1910. If you go back about every 20 or 30 years, so we're getting about 20 years out from Hellbop. So I think we're getting close to due. Fantastic. Yeah, so the system is called TRAPPIST-1. It is the first system of exoplanets that was discovered using the TRAPPIST telescope uh, with, at the European Southern Observatory in La Silla, Chile. And this system is a record breaker for quite a number of reasons. Uh, first off, there are three potentially habitable, small, Earth-sized, rocky planets. Uh, and there aren't many exoplanet systems where you have three rocky habitable zone planets. So that in itself is a very exciting discovery. Uh, the star that it is around as well, it might actually be the smallest, coolest star that we've ever discovered to host planets. Uh, the star is, I think, about as small as a star can be. It's about 8% uh, the size of the sun and, oh, sorry, is 8% the mass of the sun. It's about 12% the size of the sun, which is only slightly larger than Jupiter. And yeah, so there's a picture of it. And uh, fun fact, the, the star that hosts these three planets it actually is colder than one of the exoplanets that I'm studying in my research. So this is an incredibly ultra cool star. It's still a star, it's still fusing, and it has three habitable zone planets. Uh, 
The other reason it's it's quite an interesting target is that this system is only 40 light years away from Earth, which makes it one of the closest exoplanetary systems we've ever discovered. And it makes it an incredibly compelling target for future studies of exoplanet atmospheres. Now, because it's very close in, it's very close to us, the planets are very close to its, to its star, which means that we might actually be able to detect whether or not these planets have atmospheres and whether those atmospheres might have uh, uh, water vapor in, in the atmospheres. Um, now, because it's around uh, an M dwarf star, there are quite a few challenges there because the planets orbit on only a few days. They're incredibly close to their star, which is good if they wanna be in a habitable zone, but it's bad because M dwarfs are known to have very strong X-ray flares. And even though this discovery was only made, I was only published a few days ago, there have already been a slew of papers published uh, by astronomers cautioning that extreme X-ray flares from this star might make these planets uh, very inhospitable to life and might actually strip away all potential water from the surface. So I'm hoping that in the future when we uh, have JWST or other uh, telescopes able to look at the atmospheres, we'll be able to constrain whether or not planets around M dwarf stars actually could be habitable or not. Um, you can hear me. Skepticism now about habitability around these M class dwarf stars. I mean, originally people thought, well, the stars are just so uh, disruptive. They have these terrible flares that they just would cause any life to just be scoured off of the off of the planet. But also, you get this, you know, fairly small, cool star making for really small habitable zones. So, what is sort of the current state of thinking on this front now? I think that the, the field is sort of split in terms of people who think that planets around M dwarf stars are completely inhospitable and people who don't. My opinion is that if your planet starts off with enough water and a thick enough atmosphere, and if it has a magnetic field, even better, but if it starts off with enough water and atmosphere, even the flaring and uh, the extreme stellar winds you'd be subject to that close to the star, I think after all that stuff dies down, you'd still be left with enough water and atmosphere to make a potentially habitable world. Right. All right, well, let's uh, let's move on. Um, I think we need uh, just one last thing. What would be sort of the your preferred way or what kind of follow-up observation tool would you, would you like to get your hands on to be able to kind of take the analysis of these these worlds to the next level? I would like to get a radio velocity measurement, a Doppler measurement of this system to know whether the planets really do have a rocky composition. Right now, we just have we just have an idea of the sizes of the planets, and we're inferring from that that they're rocky. I would like to confirm that, so I want radio velocities. Uh, I would also very much like to point JWST at this target uh, to see whether or not we can detect an atmosphere. We've only got a couple of years before you can get your hands on JWST. So, so let's see what happens. Okay. All right, cool. Well, Paul, Matt, Sutter, let's talk about the uh, strongest, second strongest shockwave found in emerging galaxy cluster. Of course, that makes me wonder what was the strongest, but. Yeah, actually this title of the article is a little bit uh, poorly worded. What the researchers actually found was an incredibly strong shockwave in a cluster of galaxies. And this is the second time we found a really strong shock wave in a cluster of galaxies, not the second strongest shock wave found in a cluster of galaxies. The, the, the second strongest shock wave ever seen, and it happened to be found in a cluster of galaxies. Or no, this is the second time we've seen a very, very strong shock wave in a cluster of galaxies. Got it. Okay. So, it's the number two time we've seen this. So here's the picture that we found from the internet. Uh, can you tell yeah, us what we're looking at? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about this picture. Oh, by the way, the answer to your question, the other super strong shockwave we've seen in a galaxy cluster is the famous bullet cluster, 
which is two recently merged galaxy clusters where we did this incredible lensing map uh, looking at where the dark matter is, looking where the galaxies are, and then looking where the hot gas is. And that was really, really convincing evidence for the nature of dark matter because the dark, dark matter just swept by right each other while the gas in the cluster got all tangled up and hit each other, uh, creating these shock waves. So that was the first time we've seen something like this, and this is the second time. So in this picture, this is a false color picture, but the uh, the red color here is, uh, is basically where the galaxies are. In a galaxy cluster, is are these are the largest gravitationally bound objects. So these are the largest uh, structures in our universe. They're made up of hundreds to thousands of galaxies each. And the red dots you see there, those are the galaxies, uh, which are almost like bees in a beehive or beans in a soup. They're just kind of swimming around. Uh, green is radio sources. So some of these galaxies really light up and radio through various processes. And so they'll, they'll be glowing brightly in radio. And then lastly, blue is this X-ray emission. So... Uh, around 10% of the mass of these galaxy clusters is in the form of what we call the intra-cluster medium, which is just a hot, thin plasma that uh, 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 sits in between all of the galaxies, and it's glowing in x-rays, and this is how we detect galaxy clusters, this is how we study the physics of galaxy clusters, and so you see this big ball of blue there, that's just this diffuse gas that all these galaxies are swimming through. And this shock wave that the researchers found, uh, this galaxy cluster recently underwent a merger. And when galaxies clusters, galaxy clusters merge, these are the most powerful events in the universe ever since the Big Bang. There's somewhere around usually 10 to the 60 ergs of energy released, which is around uh, like a trillion times more powerful than a typical supernova. So super powerful stuff, biggest objects, uh, as many superlatives as you can find, you can use them to describe galaxy clusters. How much space? Yeah, a typical galaxy cluster is around a few million light year across. Looks like my audio. Oh, no, I'm back. Uh, You're back. Right. So that's about how much uh, space they are. Uh, and are we going to see these, I mean, are these clusters like this fairly uh, rare objects, or do we see these to this kind of scale in a lot of the directions that we see? Yeah, so galaxy clusters, uh, we see them all across the universe. Our own Milky Way is a member of a cluster of galaxies. We've got a cluster of galaxies next door to us, another one down the road, another one way on the other side of the town. Uh, they're all over the universe, uh, but around 80% of galaxy clusters are relaxed. They're pretty much isolated. They're done merging. They're done interacting with other stuff. They're just nice uniform balls of stuff but around 15 to 20% of them are recently merged galaxy clusters where they've recently slammed into something about the same size as them. And that's where we see these really uh, interesting active events like these gigantic shock waves propagating through them. Fantastic. Uh, and I guess you would like to get your hands on the James Webb Space Telescope as well, because I'm sure then we can look even further out and see even more of these galaxy clusters. So we'll see lots of galaxies with the JWST, but galaxy clusters, that gas emission uh, from this intercluster medium, uh, that peaks in the X-ray. So we like uh, X-ray telescopes for looking at galaxy clusters. Well, then I guess we need the James Webb Space Telescope of X-rays to be launched. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, Morgan. Yeah, so these are uh, phenomena that we've discussed before on the show. Uh, just to remind everyone, for a number of years now, astronomers with X-ray telescopes have begun to notice the stars in the sky that are very bright in the X-ray. And they're called ultra-luminous because they seem to be almost impossibly bright. And I say that because physics makes these basic predictions about how bright objects can come based on how they're generating that light. Uh, and in the case of ultra-luminous objects, we think what we're looking at are a pair of binary objects, and one of which we would call a compact object. 
And that would be like a neutron star or a small black hole or something like that. And it's basically gravitationally yanking material from another object onto its surface or into its black hole. Uh, and as that material is flooding towards the object, it's getting compressed. And we know from like, internal combustion engines that when you compress things, you heat them up. And when you heat things up, they start to push back, they increase the pressure. And so as you're heating these up, they're shining more and more brightly, but they're also pushing harder and harder away. And so you reach this equilibrium point where you can't pull any more material into you without also pushing more material away. Right. And that's thought to set this sort of upper limit on how bright objects uh, that are accreting material can actually be. And it's uh, known in the astronomy community as the Eddington limit or the Eddington luminosity. Uh, but we see this collection of objects that are shining much, much brighter than we think uh, is possible for that. Uh, and so recently uh, a study came out that looked at a couple of these uh, ultra-luminous objects in more detail using ESA's XMM-Newton X-ray telescope. Uh, and what they were able to do with this telescope is uh, make very um, precise and high resolution uh, spectra of the objects themselves. And so spectra are the patterns of light emitted by um, the material that's heating up. And what they noticed is not only all of the sort of expected uh, emission lines identifying the various elements and molecules and things that you would see uh, flowing onto uh, this object, but they also noticed a bunch of absorption. And that meant that this light was hitting something else and getting absorbed before it made its way all the way to us. Uh, and surprisingly, um, this material is traveling extremely, extremely fast, uh, about 20% the speed of light. Uh, and what this tells us is that these ultra-luminous objects have what astronomers call jets. Uh, and these are streams of extremely fast-moving particles that are probably shooting out of the poles of the object. And they come around basically uh, through conservation of momentum. Because just like an ice skater moving uh, their arms closer to their body, as this material falls in towards uh, the object, it begins to spin faster and faster and faster. And when that material begins to spin too fast, basically, it just flies off um, the handle, magnifying some tiny little velocity it might have in another direction, and it forms these two jets that come out of the poles. And so although we're no closer really to understanding uh, the exact nature of how these ultraluminous X-ray uh, objects can be as bright as they are, we are now finally putting together sort of this physical picture of what's going on in the immediate vicinity of these objects. And we now think that probably around their equators are this disk of material spiraling in and heating up, and around their poles uh, are these jets of material shooting out uh, at 20% the speed of light. And it's one of those situations where your perspective of on what you're seeing sort of changes the nature of the object that you're that you're viewing sort of like right. with if we were if our line of sight was towards the equator of one of these objects we wouldn't see these jets um but if our line of sight is towards one of the poles then this jet shines basically right at us and that's the phenomenon noticed here yeah fantastic all right let's uh move on um kimberly Let's talk about ExoMars. Phase two. Phase two of ExoMars, which was originally scheduled to launch in 2018, has now officially been delayed to launch in 2020 instead. So sad face about that. Uh, there were numerous uh, technical delays on both the European and the Russian sides. Uh, they're still in construction and they've just run into so many delays that in order, they, they would never be able to finish the construction of either the rover or the instrument landing platform uh, by their 2018 launch window. And so instead of scrapping a number of instruments, because they would have to scrap about 50% of phase two of ExoMars in order to actually make up the time they need. So in order, instead of scrapping it, they are going to just push forward and build as fast as possible understanding that they're going to miss the 2018 launch window and instead push for 2020 instead. Right, because uh, you only get those launch windows every two years, 2018. Yeah. 
and that's when the Ren Dragon is going to go to Mars, of course. And then you got 2020, and then 2022. Yeah. So Phase 1 uh, just launched about a month and a half ago or so. And they were hoping to launch Phase 2 in the next available launch window. They do say that uh, even pushing back Phase 2 by two years, they will still be able to coordinate the Phase 2, uh, the phase two which has the lander and the uh, instrument landing platform, with Phase 1, which will be at Mars uh, in like six months, eight months or so. Uh, phase 1 has the... Uh, trace gas orbiter, and it has the communications array. They say that phase one and phase two will still be able to coordinate with each other, even with a two-year delay, which is a, which is very good news. Um, and their plan to just push push ahead and build as fast as possible, and then just store it until they can launch in 2020, they say is the best way to minimize the cost of phase two without completely scrapping the project. Uh, Dave Dickinson has a comment. Well, I, I noticed reading and researching this article a bit, everybody, they seem pretty vague on exactly what's delaying, uh, they say technical issues, like Insight, when they delayed Insight, they, they were specific on what instruments, but I don't know if, if, if you've seen anything really more specific on, on what, what's exactly delaying it. I haven't seen anything specific. Uh, my impression of it is that it's not any one instrument or any one component of the phase two ExoMars, but rather a number of components that go into multiple parts of, of the lander or the landing platform. So they can't just uh, take off one piece off the table and be ready to go. I think it's all something that's integrated in multiple parts of the spacecraft. Very cool. Uh, David, isn't it going to be a good time to view Mars from here on Earth shortly? Yeah, Mars is at opposition this month, too. So it's right around May 22nd, I believe. So, And we're getting into a good cycle of oppositions where opposition is happening near uh, perihelion for Mars. 2018 is going to be nearly as good as the 2003, the historic 2003 opposition. Uh, Mars is going to be nearly 24 arc seconds across than it was 25 in 2003. So this is a good time to image. I'm seeing some really good images of Mars from a lot of amateurs. And incidentally, that's why, like, the first ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, we can only launch every 26 months to get that optimal window. So InSight didn't make it this time. Uh, a Trace Gas Orbiter went. InSight's going to go next time. Now the ExoMars, the next ExoMars mission is bumping. So we're going to see a mission every two years. Oh, and you're going to get the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, it's going to be going to oppositions now, too. Okay, so we got one last story, which is going to be, this one's coming from Paul Matt Sutter, and this is about a really, really, really big radio telescope. Is that its official name? Uh, no, I mean, that was the name I suggested, but they, they, they didn't respond to my email. So uh, they named it the 500-meter aperture spherical telescope, or FAST for short, and it's like you said, it's a giant telescope and it's going to be in China. It's bigger than Arecibo and it has some cool stuff so they can actually point it, even though it's one gigantic dish kind of carved into a mountain. Well, I guess a valley. Uh, yeah, there it is. There's a cool picture. Uh, they can actually, uh, it can flex a little bit. So it can point up to 40 degrees away from center, which is pretty cool. That's it. I just felt like I needed a second story because everyone had two stories. Yeah, can you laugh at my joke again so people think I'm funny? Nope. Now you can hear me yeah. when you go back to me. All right, well, I think we can kind of take this first inaugural flight of the new uh, streaming method of the Weekly Series Hangout to its final shaky landing. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to, as always, all the folks at the WSH crew. These are the uh, the people who have who helped us with some of the pre-testing for the last couple of days, uh, helped it a little before this, and also are just this wonderful community that act as the producers and and really help us make this show happen. A big thanks to all of you, uh, especially uh, Nancy Graziano for coordinating our, our guests. Um, so I'm gonna give people a chance to uh, to f tell us where they can find out more, but uh, Paul's still sticking around with us. So do you wanna go in? Uh, Paul, just one, just one last reminder.
Um, well, like I said before, um, NASA.gov, and then, um, you know, there's probably lots of places. I don't have a specific location where they can follow us and what we're doing, but uh, there's lots of, of uh, websites that follow NASA and, and what it's doing in human space. By, a, by an astronaut, your, your work is there. Yep, that's right. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Morgan Renberg. You can visit my website, morganrenberg.com. You can check out my YouTube page, uh, however you find pages on YouTube. Uh, Kimberly, where do people find out more? Uh, people can find out more by going to my website, KimberlyCartier.org. Uh, also by following me on Twitter at AstroKimCartier. Fantastic. Paul Matt Sutter, where do we find out more? Hey, everyone can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at Paul Matt Sutter, M-A-T-T-S-U-T-T-E-R. Also my website, pmsutter.com. I also have my own podcast where I talk about things like galaxy clusters slamming into each other for hilarious effect. That's called Ask a Spaceman, and you can find out about that at askaspaceman.com. And to support that show, you can help me pay for all my stuff that I need to do the show through Patreon, patreon.com slash pmsutter. Fantastic. And Dave Dickinson, where do people find out more? I am a frequent contributor to Universe Today, List of Source, Sky and Telescope, my own article, Astro Guys with a Z. I have uh, free fiction up on Astro Guys, free chapters, which link into my Amazon author page where you can buy entire, uh, I think I've got about 10 stories up there right now. And you can follow my adventures. I'm currently here in Spain. In a couple of weeks, we're, we're going to be running out of our 90 days of the Schengen visa in Europe. So we're going to be going over to Morocco for a bit. And you can follow our trips on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Astro Guys with the Z, just all the social media internets, we're everywhere. Fantastic. All right. And so once again, thanks to everyone for watching. Uh Bye. That's kind of cool.